Thank you, ladies. That was wonderful. And if somebody has the, there you go. All right, panic setting in. All right, very good. Luke chapter 2. Now, if you think of the Christmas story, you think of the Gospel of Luke, as according to most of us, we hear the, you know, the birth of Jesus Christ, the, uh, the subject matter, there's no room in the end. Luke chapter 2 is it's one of the key texts, not only texts, but of the Christmas story. And we look at what we traditionally go through in looking at Christmas. I have no doubt, I don't have the total count, but being here 22 years, and sometimes I would start preaching about Christmas in early December. That'd be Sunday morning, Sunday night. I, I indirectly or indirectly probably preached over 70 messages on Christmas. So, but this one is a little different. It's a little different text, and I decided that we're going to look at uh, the Christmas story, yes, but we're going to look at it how it reflects not just us, but the decisions we make and how we live our life. And there are some promises that were given, Mary and Joseph, some promises that go all the way back to Genesis chapter 3. And if you want to get into the gene genealogy of, of uh, Matthew chapter 1, as you look at the genealogy of Jesus Christ and promises were given. It was fulfillment of the Old Testament. And yes, we know that. But everybody look here, every eyeball on me. But when it actually starts to play out, it's a whole nother thing. They knew it intellectually. They knew it. They had seen angels, seen glory to God in the highest. They had seen the shepherds who had just come previously and, and, and recognized the birth of a Savior. And, of course, the wise men and the kings, they were still several years away. That's not a part of the Christmas story, but that would come later. But when they see it starting to take place, it had to impact them. Ladies and gentlemen, I want you to look, if you would, at Luke chapter 2, verse number 33. It's interesting. It says here, and this is Simeon speaking. And his father and mother, that'd be Joseph and Mary, marveled that this guy, this caretaker of the temple, this caretaker, excuse me, of the synagogue, this man who had been waiting his entire life to see the Messiah. And Jesus comes in in mom and dad's arms and he says, that's it. And his father and mother marveled at what was said about him. And Simeon blessed them. And said to Mary, his mother, behold. This child is appointed for the fall. Yes, for the fall. And for the rising of many in Israel. And for a sign that is opposed, we'll kind of unpack that here in a minute. And then there's a little parenthesis, two commas, which means you can go to the word so after that and read that and complete, but there's a little kind of statement said there, and a sword will pierce through your own soul. Mary, guess what? You're going to witness his crucifixion. And that sword's going to pierce your, pierce your soul. So that the thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. I want to preach a message I've simply titled this morning, Fulfillment of God's Promise. Let's pray together. Can we do that? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this service. I thank you for those that are tuning in online, whether it be one of our different broadcast platforms. But I pray right now for everybody under the sound of my voice that we would understand God's promises for us and know that they will and can be fulfilled. And Lord, help us live the Christian life. Help us accept the piercing of the heart and also for the rising of many. 
Lord, guide and direct. Fill me with the Holy Spirit. Give me wisdom beyond my years. It's in Christ's name I pray. Amen and amen. In my life and in your life, there are times when things start to play out. You may have seen something coming from a, a far off. You knew it was out there. But as it got closer, depending upon what it is, you got excited. You got excited about it. You started to see it take place. And I believe this is what's happening here. I think from the time that I left high school in 1978, I went to Auburn University, and the whole football thing didn't work out very well, so that wasn't going to happen. But I remember I got into engineering, and I remember sitting in a class of about 300 freshman engineering students, and the professor would sit there and said, look to your left, look to your right, look in front of you. You just looked at three people. Two of those three are not going to graduate, and it may be you. Such an encouragement thing to say to a bunch of 18-year-olds that are all at college, right? And I remember going through that, and I looked at my course schedule, and I said, oh, there's this and this and this. And, and I remember my grade point, I wasn't very smart. I tried really hard, but I wasn't an academic genius. But my goal was just to graduate and get a job, because, by the way, after you graduate and get a job, nobody cares what your GPA is after you graduate. They just want to know what you can do. But you got to get to gra you got to graduate. I often tell that to young people. They're going to get this degree and get a 4.0, or they can this degree get a 2.0, but this degree has a job. That one has no job. Little comments I say to my children. Anyway, but the point was, after years and years and years, I never forget, I'm finally in December of 1982. I'm two weeks away from graduation, and it finally hit me. This is really going to happen. I just had to pinch myself. It's going to happen. And I believe many ways, and that's a poor illustration to look at it, Mary and Joseph, man, they've heard this stuff. Mary knew she, she, she had a calling from God. She heard from God about that she would be a child. Joseph had a dream that he was to take Mary to be his wife, even though she was a child prior to marriage. And they knew that. That was spoken to them. And they, saw they, had, to, they had to go from Galilee all the way down to Bethlehem, south, about 90 miles and admit, right at the end of her, right before she was due. And you know the story, there was no room at the end. And they saw God working, they saw the angels coming, they saw the shepherds there. They knew that something big was happening. Fast forward to this text. It's now 40 days later. Well, the circumcision was eight days later, seven days later, but right here the the cleansing where they were going to the temple was 40 days later, according to the Jewish rabbinic law, according to Levitical law. And now it's starting to play out. It's really going to happen. They marveled. Look what he says here. His father and the father and mother marveled. Now that, that word has so much meaning in the English. We just say, well, they marveled. It's a depth of rich, of amazement. Of what God is doing. Let me ask you this. Everybody look here. When is the last time in your life and my life we have a marvel at what God's doing? Oh, so what? I mean, we're all that way. I'm that way. If you want to meet Mr. Negative, sometimes that's me. They marveled about what was said. Oh, yeah. This. It's going to happen. Oh, yeah. Let me ask you this. What is God doing in your life that you're marveling about? Or you should be marveling. What is God doing in your life spiritually? What, about you, what are you anxious about? In every Christian life, we'll, we're going to face difficulties. We'll talk about that here in a minute. Trials and tribulations will sometimes cause us to question our faith. Whether you're making the right choices. But God loves us. There will be times when a Simeon will show up in your life and he will confirm what God has said and that's when we marvel. The Bible says where your treasure is, there your heart will also be, will, will be also. 
Proverbs 3, 5 says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean on your own understanding. Always acknowledge Him, and He shall direct your path. Think about Mary and Joseph. Mary is with child prior to marriage. Sit on that one for a while. By the way, that could be death. Think about Joseph, and he, he learns in a dream that she's with child, and he obeys in one of obedience, and he takes Mary in spite of her condition outwardly. Matthew 1.20 says this, But he considered these things. Behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for, you'll save, for he shall save his people from their sins. What faith these people had! Going against the grain. When time came for Mary to deliver, it didn't turn out real well, did it? They had to travel 90 plus miles from Galilee all the way down to Bethlehem, which is just the city of David, which is just to the south, southeast of Jerusalem. Actually, you can actually see it from the, from the Temple Mount. You can see the, the buildings of Bethlehem, at least we could when we were there. They finally get there. There's a census. Oh my, what bad timing. I can't believe that we've got to travel all the way to Gal all the way to Bethlehem from our hometown. And she's due any day. But that's what they did. They get there thinking, wow, well, okay, I guess we get there. God knows that this is a child from, you know, conceived by the Holy Spirit. We know that. We know that. We think. Well, surely there's going to be a red carpet rolled out for us. But that's, that's what we say as Americans, right? We're the privileged few. God has chosen us to be the anointed of the planet, and everybody should bow down to us. We find that doesn't happen, does it? They get to Bethlehem, and guess what happens? There's no room, so they have to go to what we call a manger. It's really what we call a cattle trough. It's a, it's a carved out parson of, of, of a little hill there. It's a cave. Uh, a stone cave, and they have to be there with the animals, all of them defecating, and blah, 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 blah. Uh, really? A little discouraging, right? Could be. She gave birth to her firstborn son, wrapped him in swaddling clothes. By the way, those are strips of nasty cloth. Not some... something we would think today is something very clean. For some reason, I just lost my... Gentlemen, if you could help me up there, I just lost my... It's gone. Okay. So they're trying to figure that out. I will just fly solo. Anyway. Go back to the old way. Next, we ought to lose our microphones, turn the electricity off. It'll be just like they were 100 years ago. By the way, got to turn the heat off, too, by the way. Or we can... You know, we'll see how that works. Some of you already think the heat's off the way it's so cold in here. And she gave birth to her firstborn son, wrapped him in swaddling clothes, laid him in the manger because there was no place for them in the, in the inn. The shepherds would visit, as we said, and it was bang, 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 quickly, quickly. Their life is starting to fulfill. It happened one after another. Have you ever been in a circumstance in your life where it's just one, one, and you wake up and go, what is going on here? And welcome, everybody here. All right. I'm glad you're back. We'll start all over. Girls, come up and start singing again. But it's just happening again and again so quickly. And the story picks up today as now they're heading to the temple for the circumcision, which would take place a few days, seven days after the birth. And then they would go later. That the, the, second, the next verse talks about the, the cleansing of Mary. But the big idea here, let's all find it. It's here somewhere. There it is. The big idea is God's fulfillment of his promises should lead us to obedience, wonder, and joy. So let's ride right into that thing. The first thing is we find obedience. The fulfillment of God's promise brings obedience. They were being obedient. Let's read through this. In the end of eight days, when he was circumcised, that would be following the law, Jesus would be circumcised. He was called Jesus. That name was given to him earlier 
by an angel before he was conceived in the womb. And then later, now we're going to skip forward another 30 days, plus or minus, Mary is going to be coming to the temple and they'll present Jesus there. And the time came for their purification according to the law of Moses, and they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. So they're bringing Jesus, the purification of Mary, which would take place according to Jewish law some 40 days after her delivery. And then we find, as is written in the law of the Lord, every male who first opens the womb shall be called holy unto the Lord and to offer sacrifice to what is said in the law of the Lord. A pair of turtle doves are two young pigeons. So we see there, and do not miss this, they were obedient. They did what they were supposed to do. First, there was the circumcision of Jesus. This would, he was eight days old. It was a token of a covenant between God and Abraham. On this same day, the child was named according to Jewish custom. The angel had previously instructed them to name him Jesus. You would not name your child until after he was circumcised, according to Jewish tradition and custom. The second obedience concerned the purification of Mary. It took place 40 days after the birth of Jesus. They would follow what they follow, Levitical law, according to Leviticus 12. They were to bring, and then they were to bring, the parents were to bring a lamb for a burnt offering and a young pigeon or turtle dove for a sin offering. But in the case of poor people, remember, we're talking about poor people. Poor people don't have a lamb. Jesus was born in a major. He was from a poor family. Sit on that for a while as we celebrate Christmas. So in the case of poor people, they were permitted to bring a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. And the fact that Mary brought no lamb but only two young pigeons, as we just referenced, is a reflection of the poverty that Jesus was born into. And the third thing of obedience was they would present Jesus at the temple. The parents are permitted to buy him back with a shekel. That's not referenced here, but that was the, the, for, the formality they would do. I guess I'm going through all this to tell you something important. They were obedient. You want to see God work? Be obedient. Obedience. Fulfilling a, fulfilling a promise means they're obedient. There's a lesson here. 1 John 5, 3, For this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not burdensome or grievous, as the King James says. Luke 6, 46 says this, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not what I say? All right, I tell you. The key to the Christian life is being obedient. But let me tell you what obedience is not. It's not following rules or standards. It's being surrendered to God's will. It's a surrender. Many times in the circles that we run in, sometimes we think obedience is just what we got to do. It's to do what you don't do and what you do. Too many times we talk about obedience, it means a, a standards gospel. Now that you are saved, here's the list of things you can do and not do. It's adherence to a narrow moral code and standards that other Christians may not even agree with, and sometimes it's even biblical. When you follow that way of thinking, the enemy is the world. Other Christians are not like you. They're the, they're the enemy, sometimes more than the world. And the very people you're to reach are the enemy. And other Christians that are wrong, when they get right, by, get right with God, they'll be just like you. That's not it at all. In fact, that's the opposite of surrender. Surrender means that now you are saved, you surrender His will for your life. And that brings obedience, by the way. By the way, the first ultimately fails in frustration. Some walk away from the faith of a defeated Christian life, not able to live up to the rules that have been set before them. That's not, and I had to say that. When I talk about obedience, the first thing that comes to some people's mind is all the things I've got to do and I can't do, and how you, in your flesh you'll never be there. That's why Christ came to die for your sins, because we're sinners saved by grace. We're, we're, in, we're to believe in progressive sanctification. In other words, we're to walk with God, knowing that we will trip up occasionally. Then there's the consumer gospel. The obedience doesn't come at all. In other words, they equate it with agreement to a bunch of religious facts. I said a prayer. Now that I'm in, I'll never have to, I'll never in, 
never leads to obedience. They equate it with some agreement to religious facts. It's transactional, but not transformative. In other words, there's a transaction that takes place, but it never transforms your life. Repentance and sacrifice are never mentioned. They're consumer-driven. What can the church or Christianity do for me? I was listening to a podcast the other day. A pastor said somebody came to him and he says, what can this church do for me? And he says, how about what can you do for the church? Not that that necessarily is right either. So we find here there was obedience. There was holiness. There was righteousness. There was godliness. And that's, yes, that's obedience. So fulfilling a promise also brings wonder and amazement. When you start to see it pan out, and that's where I opened up this message. Sure, that the obedience, they came to Jerusalem. They came to the circumcision of Christ. He was circumcised on the eighth day. They also came to Jerusalem to, uh, for Mary's purification and to present Jesus there. And now we have an interesting story. There was, now there was a man in Jerusalem, his name was Simeon, and his man was righteous and devout, waiting for the, for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. He had been there his whole life. He had been told, when Jesus, the Messiah shows up, you'll know it. He had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit. He would not see death before he had seen the Lord Christ. And he came in the Spirit to the temple when the parents brought the child to do him according to the custom of the law, there's obedience. Imagine that scene. I've been told you're coming and here you are. He took him up his arms, took that baby and blessed him. And God and said, and this is a song actually that was made, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, he says. A light for the revelation to the Gentiles. By the way, that had not go real well. And glory for your people Israel. And they're hearing this. Now think about this, Mary and Joseph. They just heard this man say, I've been waiting for your child to show up. He is the Messiah. A light for the Gentiles. And they marveled at what was said. Wonder and amazement. Simeon saw what God had promised. Let me ask you this. Have you ever got goosebumps when God started to do something? I'll just put it in southern vernacular, okay? Have you ever in your life got excited because God, there's something happening here. I can't quite put my finger on it. But I think God's doing something. I've seen that in this church many times over the years. I've seen it when people came to know Christ that hadn't, from the world's perspective, even from our perspective, had no, you never thought they would get saved. I've seen it happen as various times in the ministry of this church and my family. I didn't think this would, something is happening. Wow, wonderful. Simeon saw what God had promised. But just as wonderful, Mary and Joseph are saying, Oh, my. I guess this last 40 days, now imagine what you, they went through. Just put this last 40 days and the time before. One, two, three, four, five. Now this? I've seen God work in a mighty way. I give you a particular example, and I won't mention names, but it's recent. COVID hit March 15th, not that I'm counting days, of 2020. We had a service here on Wednesday night, and on Thursday they shut down everything. By the way, that was before all the court rulings that churches couldn't shut down. We did shut down for 15 weeks, by the way. 
which I don't regret at the time. I don't regret doing that. You know, it is what it is. But I remember shutting that down, and the Lord was working on my heart on a lot of things in the church, and blah, 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 and I was, and I, 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 I bumped into a pastor who's now one of my best friends. And as I started to talk to him, we had never, ever spoken a single word, ever. And I found out the very things that I'd have put on my heart, and I'm not kidding, exactly they were either doing or in the process of doing. And what an encouragement. You know, we need friends. We need people, right? And I sat down, and we started talking, and we prayed, and I said, wow, did you listen? Yeah, I know that. And I go, man, this is good. I'm not out there in left field thinking that. There's somebody like me. And I got so excited. I'm still excited just thinking about it. And, and I, I said, you know what? This is what I can equate to this. You know, Mary and Joseph, they heard all this stuff and they saw it. And then all somebody, somebody comes up to Simeon and says the very same thing. They're excited. It was good. This happened to be that he was in the temple on the, in the area of the day that Jesus' parents are presenting to God. Simeon was supernaturally instructed that this child was the promised Messiah. He took him in his arms. He uttered what we call is a well-known song, Nunic Dimitus, now you are letting depart. The burden of the song was, Lord, now you are letting me depart in peace. I've seen your salvation in the person of this baby, the promised Redeemer, and you promised me, you ordained him to provide salvation for all classes of people, look here, including the Gentiles. On seeing this child and picking him up, Simeon praised God. The response of the godly people toward the Messiah, through the Gospel of Luke, he praised him. The words of Simeon caused Mary and Joseph to marvel. They've been told their son was the Messiah. Perhaps they had not comprehended it completely. But buddy, look here. They get it now. Amazed. Look what God is doing. Maybe they just fell down after they heard it. When God fulfills a promise, you'll wonder and be amazed. The healing of a friend a financial blessing, a radical change. Mary and Joseph must have looked at each other and said the following. Now, I'm just going to give it to you. Wow. Are you kidding? By the way, that's the kind of God we have. Not some boring, liturgical, blah, 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 Christmas, get it over with so I can go back to my way. Mary and Joseph looked at each other. And I love this verse. It says, and they marveled at what he said about him. Now, let me get to the other part. I would be remiss if I didn't talk about the other part of what's going on. Fulfillment of God promises, lastly, brings joy. Now, look here. Do not miss this. And heartache. Let's read through it. And Simeon blessed them and said unto Mary's mother, Behold, this child is set for the fall, those who would not accept, right? And the rising of many in Israel, those who would. And for a sign which would be spoken against, in other words, his name would be identified with righteousness and identify their sin, that would be a sign. And then there's that little interesting thing, look, the semicolon there, if you just want to be a grammatician here, and then we have that little statement, then it goes back to what it was saying before. Yea, a sword shall pierce through thine own soul also. Mary, guess what? This is all good news. Your son's a redeemer, but you're going to really have some heartache. Because according to the gospel records, you're going to witness the death of your son. Prophetic, wasn't it? Sometimes God promises can be revealed through heartache, pain. It's the pain that makes God real sometimes. 
It's the pain that gets us going. It's the accountability that forces us to move. Let me ask this. I don't know if you've ever done this, but in college, do you ever audit a class? When you audit a class, that means you sit there, you listen to it, but you don't take the test. Do you think you get more out of it when you have to take the test and you know you're going to be accountable for it? I heard a pastor the other day, he talked about, uh, he's teaching a class, his name's Bill Hull, he teaches, uh, actually some of our, our people going to graduate school right now have him, and I'm, I'm not sure, I can't believe it's this late, but Anyway, the point is, he said, I, I have a class on discipleship. And it's an undergraduate class at a certain college. And he says, here's what I did. I told all the people there, I said, your disciples are to make disciples. Disciples are to make other disciples. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to take this class, and every week, you're going to go tell somebody about what you learned in this class. And they go, oh, we can do that. And he says, at the end of the semester, the 15 weeks, here's what you're going to do. They're going to take the test for you how much you taught them. Isn't that what we're supposed to do? Oh, I like my Sunday school class. Oh, I like my church. I like my, my, my. Or do we tell anybody? We're not to keep it in. Disciples are to make disciples. And so we find that sometimes it, it takes that. The child was destined for the rising of the fall. And then it says, a sword will pierce your own soul also. Simeon was here predicting the grief which would flood Mary's heart when she witnessed the crucifixion of her son in John chapter 19, verse 25. Yes, look here. God's promises bring joy. Sometimes they'll bring heartache. Mary would understand. So what am I saying to you this morning? Where is God's promise leading you? Obedience will bring marveling. Obedience will also bring heartache. But most important, obedience will bring joy. Where are you in your life? Let's let Christ be real and alive at Christmas, not just getting through it so we can open the plastic stuff and have it in the landfill in six months. Maybe God is more than that. Let's let him be real this Christmas season. Let's pray together with every head bowed and every eye closed. Can we pray? Dear Heavenly Father,